Well, good Sunday morning, church. How you feeling today? Yeah, you guys are fired up. Maybe just one cup of coffee shy of full energy today, right? Like having a good time, though. I want to welcome you to church. I'm glad that you are here. If you're new, you're hanging out for the first time. My name is Jack, and I get to be one of the pastors here. We're thrilled that you chose to hang out with us this weekend. We think that there's no better way to begin your Sunday than right here with us. And uh, if you don't know a lot about our church, uh, we just think this is the perfect place for imperfect people. So if you came trying to, like, cover it all up and try to pretend you're somebody that you're not, hey, just let the walls down, right? All right? We're, we're all messed up in here, and, and, and we just acknowledge it, right? Uh, but the good news is, no matter where you're from, where you've been, what you've done, no matter how much you know about Jesus, how little you know about Jesus. We just need you to know we think you belong here. And so I, I would like to, to tell you, welcome home, right? Welcome home. You found a great place to just celebrate Jesus. I also want to say hey to those tuning in online, uh, our live feed or on our Facebook live. We love you guys and uh, just glad that you are staying tracking with what's going on here at City Line Church. Today, I'm going to kind of just dive right in uh, to uh, part two of this new series that we kicked off last week that we're calling Make Room. It's, it's all about quieting the noise, clearing the clutter, and, and really just trying to, to know what it means to prepare for greater. Because here's the deal. A, a lot of times, the beginning of the year, we said we just kind of tend to start off with this mental fresh start, right? It's a mental clean slate. It's like, hey, this year is my year. I, I got do-overs, right? Whatever I didn't accomplish last year or the last few years, I'm going to do it this year for sure. And then we get a few weeks into our new year only to realize that there's a big difference between what's in our head and what's in our heart. In other words, we've got good ideas, we have the best of intentions, but yet at the same time, we've got some baggage that isn't quite clear. We've got some stuff that's crowding room that's not making the space or allowing the space for God to work and to move in our life. In fact, the one way we said it is you have to understand this. If we're going to make room, there's a big difference between wanting and being willing. This idea of we all want God to work in our life. We all want the promises of God. We all want the best things that God has for us. We all want God to bless everything that we're doing. But at the same time, the better question is, are we willing to allow God to do the work necessary in our lives so that we can receive his best for our life? Can we live into this actual, this idea of something greater? If we know that he has something greater for us, will we be willing to allow him to move some things out of our life? And here's the catch on moving some things out of our life. Sometimes those things aren't bad things. Sometimes those things are really good things. Here's the catch, though. They're just not the best things. They're not the best things in our life. What would it look like to allow God to move out whatever unnecessary things so I can receive his greater things as I process into this new year? We said 2019 can be your best year personally as long as you are willing to make it your best year spiritually. So we're making room so we can grow spiritually. We're being willing and open to God working and moving in our life, to, to clearing things, some, some things out of our life. And I wanted an illustration for that to kind of hopefully help solidify and make sense what we're talking about. Because, I mean, if you, if you imagine this is kind of like life a lot of times, you know, like life, we, we have our time, right, all of our energy and all of our effort. But let's be honest, like we, we've got some rocks in our life, the big, the little rocks, they just kind of make a lot of noise in our life, right? They just constantly are making noise in, day in and day out. I got work, I've got appointments, I got all this stuff. Those of you that have kids, yours is like this. Right? It's just a whole, you know, and we've got all these things. It's constant. It's nonstop. I mean, life is just full of no shortage of things that I got to do, got to get done. Everything seems important. Everything seems pressing. And we want to do it all. We want to accomplish everything. And we don't want to leave anything out. We're going to make sure that we live life to the fullest. But then at the same time, we know there's some other things going on in our life that are really the most important things. And we know we should get to those things. We know those things are the best for us. They're, they're, they're the bigger rocks, right? They're the things that we know. It's just things like, you know, we should really be involved in our church. We should probably be, really be serving. We should, we should be pouring into to our marriage, right? We've got all these things. And we want to try to make those things fit in there too. But before we, before we know it, we know that like, hey, we wish, we wish we could make it all happen. But the reality is we can't. And so here's what we think. You know what? I just, need a, I just need a bigger container, right? I just, I just, need, to, I just need to expand my capacity. I just need to, here's my suggestion. What if you just let some things go? Well, what if the key to, to this, this great new year, the, the key to you living your best life personally because it's your best life spiritually is not about adding more things, but it's about removing some things, placing some things as priority, as the most important things, and allowing God to orchestrate everything else around it. 
to which some of you are like, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what, the, what that means and what that looks like, right? Because most of us aren't living our life that way. Here's what I would suggest. What if we, what if we just started with the big rocks first? What, what if we said, you know what, that we're going to pay attention to our relationship with God, right? That's something of utmost importance. We're going to pay attention to our family dynamics. We're going to pay attention to our husband or to our wife. You know what, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour into myself spiritually. I'm going to begin practicing those things that we talked about last week that opened me up for God to do the things that I can't do on my own. And then here's what's going to happen. Life is just going to fall into place around that. And all those things that crowded me that were so busy that I felt like I just didn't have enough time for everything, suddenly we realize that when we start with the most important things, that suddenly everything seems to fit. That suddenly everything seems to make sense. That, 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 that those main things, those, those most important things, actually have the power and potential to affect and change everything in my life. But there's a big difference between wanting and willing. In our next few moments together, as we kind of, kind of lean into this idea of making room a little bit, today I'd like to talk about what does it look like to make room in your relationships, in your relationships. And some of you are immediately glad that you came to church today because you're like, yeah, we need some relationship help. And here's what I need to tell you. Like, this is not a marriage seminar today, but everything that's talked about can help you in your marriage, right? This is not about how to date great, right, a seminar either, but this is, this is going to help you in your dating life. Okay, and for those of you that are hanging out around church, you know, single and ready to mingle, your favorite time is the meet and greet, you know, you're strategic, you sit by the cute one, right, like, yeah, I see you, you know what I'm saying, hey, th th this, this is not your seminar either, but everything that's talked about is going to help our relationships in general if we, if we are willing, if we're willing to make some changes, if we're willing to, to do things different, if we're willing to make the space for God to do something incredible in our life. Here's what you gotta know about you and I. Uh, we were hardwired to be in relationships. You may have heard that before. Relationships were actually God's idea from the very beginning. In fact, I would say it like this. If you're taking notes, our relationships, well, they'll always determine the quality and the direction of our lives. Our relationships will always determine the quality and the direction of our lives, right? I mean, think about this, like, you, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You ever thought about it that way? Show me who you're hanging out with. Show me who you allow to influence your life, and, and, and I'll show you your future. The, the, the relationship piece, this, this friendships, couples, marriages, dating, whatever it is, will always determine the quality and the direction of our life. That you and I, we were created to be in relationships. God, from the very beginning, intended it this way. He never intended us to go throughout life being alone. From the very beginning, the creation narrative, God begins to create the earth, and he creates the heavens, the sky, the moon, the stars, the water, land, and sea. I mean, there, there's all these beautiful things that God is creating, and at the end of creating all of them, he says, that's good, that's good, uh, and that's good, and that's good. And then the next thing you know, he creates humanity. He breathes life, like physical life into nothing, right? Adam he takes his first breath, and, and, and Adam now has everything at his fingertips, all these things that God created, you can imagine the beauty of the garden, but yet God stands back and observes and says, hold up, time out. It's not good. Wait, wait, what do you mean it's not good? Yeah, Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God said, it's not, it's not good. What, what's not good? It's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for people to go through life without community. It's not good for people to go through life without relationships, without friendships. It's not good. You were never meant to do life alone. It's fascinating. Uh, author John Ortberg, he, he says something about this particular passage of Scripture in this creation narrative. He says, when we read chapter 2 of Genesis, the fall has not yet occurred. No sin, no disobedience, nothing to mar the relationship between God and man. Yet Adam walks with God in the garden in the cool of the day. He's known and loved to his core, to his very being by this omniscient, love-filled creator. Yet the word, God, the word that God uses to describe Adam is alone. We should let us know that we could have everything we ever wanted, everything we ever felt like we needed. We, we can come to church and we can sit in a room filled with a lot of people and still be the loneliest person in the room. We can have Facebook, we can have Instagram, there's nothing wrong with that. 
Also, I'm going to talk about it today because I think it influences our relationships. Here's the reality. We could have lots of friends on social media, but yet still be the loneliest person on the planet. And that was never God's intention for us to, to walk through life alone, even with all your stuff. So here's something I want to do to kind of help us set this up today as we kind of process through this a little bit today. On your notes, I want you to take some time. I'm going to give you some instructions, so don't start writing right away. I want you to jot down your top three relationships. And here's the thing. If you're married, it can't be your spouse, okay? And I'm sorry, it can't be your cat. And I'm sorry that it can't be your dog, okay? I'm talking about, I want your top three, like these are your best friends, your closest friends. These are friends that know you, that love you, that you're transparent with. They know everything about you. They know your deep, dark secrets. Go ahead, you can start writing now. Like I, I'm, 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 I'm trying to help you to, to write down these top three people that you are so close with. These are people that you could call at two o'clock in the morning and they'll, what's going on? They'll be right there to help you. They're, they're there to serve you. Go, go ahead. I see some of you just looking at me like, I didn't, I didn't know there was going to be a test in church today. You know what I mean? Like I didn't, no, just, just think about this. Like, like, like write, write down your top three relationships that, that you feel like you have. That, that, I mean, they're the closest to you. They're, you're, they're your go-to people. And it's beyond just family, too. Don't write, like, Uncle Jojo or, you know, like, I mean, Uncle Jojo, I mean, he's got things to do, right? Like, I'm talking about your friends. Like, these are your people. Here's what I'm getting at. I, I, I tend to believe, I, I tend to think, and there's actually studies that prove this, that many of us in the room are having a difficult time identifying three people. That some of us, if we're lucky, we've got one, maybe two. But statistically, sociologists actually say that the average American would consider that they have less than two friends that are actually close friends. The majority of us find ourselves on the opposite end of the spectrum where we have zero friends. We have acquaintances. We know of people. We're in relationship with people like by, by proximity, but you know what? Physical presence, like, like actually something real, something tangible, well, that, that seems to be a bit of a elusive in our life for lots of different reasons. And have you ever thought about what those reasons are? Have you ever thought about why that is in our life? Have you ever thought about like not just your top three, right? Like who is your top three? Like who would be there? Right? But, but have you ever thought about this? What's actually robbing us of real relationships? And here's what I want to say about that. It's not someone else's fault. As much as we want to point to other people, as much as we start to think, hey, it goes to other, like, look, the reason, the reason why we're robbed of real relationships, it might not be somebody else's problem. It might be something going on in here. We said in the very first week of this series that this is going to be something that challenges us to have some self-awareness, that some of us do, don't do so well with self-awareness. We think we know everything we need to know, but we don't do so well in assessing ourselves. What if we took an introspective look, allow God to shine a light on some things that, that may not be quite right, but if we allow him to, to move some things, we, we can make room to experience some, some life-giving relationships. But what are the things that are robbing us from our relationships? I'm going to give you four. There's probably more, but I think these are four big ones that kind of make a lot of sense in people's life. That Actually, two of them, I think, come directly from what we just read in Genesis because later on you see this disconnection, this fragmented relationship between humanity and God, right, that we, that we see kind of just filter through our relationships with not just our relationship with God but with others. And the first is this. I think it's the fear of rejection. It's the fear of rejection. All of us are so afraid to, to be rejected. We, 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 we live in fear of what others will think, that, that, we're, that we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, that we don't, we don't have what it takes. We, we begin to buy that lie of, I'm not enough. I'm, I'm, I'm not enough. When Scripture tells us something different, but yet when we're being robbed of our relationships, when we're being robbed of this thing that God has created us for and hardwired us for, we have to acknowledge what's going on when we're, when we're living in this kind of fear. When we're living in the fear of rejection and so worried about what others think and what other people are going to say and what if they push me away, if they truly knew the real me, they might not like me. Here's what ends up happening in that moment, okay? The reality is you're so afraid to be rejected that you go from being the rejected to being the rejecter. That you're the one rejecting people. People aren't rejecting you. You're the one pushing away from people, so it feels like people are pulling away from you, but you, 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 you're just living in this fear, and you got to understand, fear, fear sucks the life out of you. Fear only takes from you. Fear never gives anything to you. 
It robs you of real relationships when you're living in this fear of rejection. And maybe you're not there, but what about this? This, this one, I think, is it, it, we've all lived in it at some point in time. It's the ease of isolation. It's so easy to isolate, right? Relationships are hard. Relationships are difficult. Like, relational dynamics are interesting sometimes. We know we need to have the hard conversation because we're sensing, like, a little bit of tension. Like, we're sensing, like, ah, things are kind of off and awkward. But, but we don't want to have the conversation, right? We don't, we don't want to address the issue. What we'll do is we'll let that thing kind of linger and fester over here, and we'll be over here. We're just gonna we're just gonna isolate. We're just gonna withdraw from the situation. Totally withdraw. Why? Because it's easier than having a conversation. It's easier than talking about it. It's easier than sitting eye to eye and knee to knee and agreeing to disagreeing, but yet still coming to a solution on where do we go from here? How does this play out from here? We would rather just simply isolate and pretend that like we've got it. We'll, we'll figure it out. We build walls up to, to keep people out that we think that somehow we're going to protect ourselves and be safe inside there. All the while, all we're doing is just feeding off the lie that says that individualism simply promises a more fulfilled life. Because we begin to think when we're isolating ourselves that I don't need anybody anyway. And it's actually kind of easier when I'm by myself. It's, 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 just, it's just easy. It's just better when I'm by myself. Like, I don't need all the drama. So I'm just, going to, I'm just going to remove myself from that. Again, let me point you to the fact that this idea of isolation, aloneness, is not God's intention for your life. You and I were not created to live that way, and you want to know why? Because growth, true spiritual growth, growth of any kind, never happens in isolation. Growth, life-giving growth, happens always within the context of community, within the context of relationships. That's why we hit so hard all the time at City Line Church, that part of who we are, the core of who we are, is that we're passionately pursuing Jesus, and what are we doing? We're building authentic community as we choose to live generously and lead well. Building this authentic community, what God has given to us, this gift that God has created us for, many of us just choose to isolate and we end up deficient. I think this is a big one, too, that a lot of people don't realize. It just kind of slowly happens over time. But we've ended up as a society, as a culture, with a fractured view of friendship. You ever thought about this, this fractured view of friendship? Those of you that have lived life for a while... You know, I'm talking about the older, wiser group in the building, right? We're a, we're a, a multi-generational church, and I love that because you got to pull from some of the wisdom of people who have been there, done that already. You know, you can trace back just to a few years ago when friendships, they were a lot different than what they mean now, right? I mean, friendships, get this about, about friends. You actually had a physical person that you showed up and hung out with, that you, that you went and got coffee with, that you actually, like, had lunch with. That you actually, I don't know if you know this, but like you don't just text on the phone. You could actually pick it up, dial a number, and call and talk to a real person. It's crazy. You remember those days, right? Where, where many of us, we grew up in a culture, we don't have that. That, that. that we have a fractured view of friendship. You know why? Because friendship has taken on a whole new meaning, especially with the invention of social media. Friends used to be a physical person that you hung out with. Now friends are somebody that you've never met who follows what you say or what you post on Facebook or Instagram. And we feel so good about it because you know why? You can have hundreds and thousands of those people all waiting for what you say and waiting for what you're going to do next that it makes us feel so good that we think we're so connected. But I think we could also argue the point that with all that connectivity, Although we have lots of online interaction, many of us have very limited personal intimacy with anyone. We're missing something. There's something deficient. There's something blocking. There's something in the way. And what is that thing in the way? I think that you and I are easily, because of this social media craze, because of this fractured view of friendship, guess what? We're addicted to this like, immediate affirmation. That friendships have become not just about us giving and receiving this mutuality. Friendships have become all about us. We love this immediate gratification. We have friends online, and if we're feeling alone, we're feeling a little bit lonely, we're feeling a little bit distant from people, we know that all we have to do is take a selfie. 
take a selfie, post it online, and within seconds, minutes, we've got likes, the hearts are going crazy, right? We've got comments like, where did you get that shirt? That's an awesome shirt. You know, like, well, did you do something different to your hair? And then we get so, like, we get so wrapped up. And, and, and you know what? Psychologists say there's actually, there, there's this something going on in our brain, a chemical that's firing. There's this dopamine that's happening that gives us all the feels, and it feels so good because in this moment, we feel, we feel loved. We, 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 feel, we feel like, oh, we're not alone. Like, people still care about us. They, they, they care about what we're posting. And, and then we go to the next craze, and we're just like, well, well let's just read what they said. And did they like it? And wait, wait, who, who liked it? Wait, wait, time out. How many people liked it? Gosh, three shy of 100? Are you kidding me? Wait, wait, time out. Why didn't she like it? Hold up. They never like any of my pictures. I'm not going to like theirs either. <laughs> right? We do that all the time. We, we, we get so caught up and, and wrapped up. In, in the same, and you know what's happening in that whole time? All we're doing is in this moment of feeling this instant gratification, this, this, this immediate thing that's happening to us, all we're doing is deferring the inevitable that we're still lonely. We're still lonely. And what we're doing is we're trying to fulfill this deep-seated need for something greater with this simple little quick fix. Oh, it's been forever since my spouse even paid any attention to me. But you know what? Instagram loves me. Oh, you don't want me to go there? I won't. Something to consider, though. A fractured view of friendship. A, a fractured, we, we, we defer our loneliness. We, we, we look to other things and to other people to provide for us what God can only provide. We look to other things and other people for, for, to fill this, this, this void that's, that's in our heart. And, and if it's not fractured view of friendship for us, if we've never considered that, maybe for many of us it's just simply this. It's the pain of our past, isn't it? It's the pain of our past. We've had some really bad relationships. We've gone through some tough stuff. There's some pain that comes with that. There's some things that we continually kind of just, it's just scar tissue. We, kinda, we just kind of lug it around. And because we lug it around, here's what we do. We end up using the pain of the past as excuse or justification as to why we operate the way we do in relationships now. That because we've not been fully healed from those things, because we've not allowed God to remove those things, to heal those scars, to replace that with something new and something fresh, we end up just kind of living in this same cycle that we repeat the same behaviors over and over again because well, we're, we're just stuck reeling from the pain in the past. We, we, if we stay stuck in the past, we can never experience anything greater in our future. What's true of our lives is also true uh, of our relationships. It's, it's this, this pain. That's, that's where relationships become difficult. And all four of these ideas of what may be kind of hindering us or blocking us, I think the key thought and the key theme is, is that sometimes we just have a twisted view of relationships as a whole. We have a twisted view, not just of relationships, but what does it mean to live in a healthy relationship? If there's a requirement to live in healthy relationships, whether it be parent to, 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 to a kid or whether it be spouse to spouse or whether it be friend to friend, coworker, there, there's a missing component in there because of just, you know, over time things have, have become broken. We saw that from Genesis where humanity chooses to go against God's best for their life and that creates this disconnect, that sin enters the picture and now relationships are marred. But you know what I love about, about scripture? You know what I love about Jesus? It's Jesus cares about relationships. Jesus is a fan of relationships. In fact, the entire narrative of, of scripture, if you think about it, is all about relationships. It's about God being on pursuit to restore broken relationships with humanity so that humanity can now restore broken relationships with other people. And how does God do it? God continuously pours out his love. He pours out his love in a way that no one ever thought thought possible. He sends his son Jesus to die on the cross so that we would no longer have to live in the fear of rejection. We would no longer have to choose to isolate or withdraw. We would no longer have a twisted picture of what does it mean to be a friend. We would no longer be stuck in the pain of our past that Jesus took all those things to the cross and he died once and for all so that I could be made new, that I could be made whole again, that I could see my worth and value doesn't lie in what others think of me or the way my world treats me but it comes first from the Father's love for me. And in fact, when you begin to embrace that love and you start there with your relationships, you start with a relationship with God, let me help you with something. It changes everything. It changes our perspective. It, you, you go from this, like 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul says it this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, therefore, if anyone has placed Jesus as Lord of their life, 
Anyone has said yes to a relationship with Jesus, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, guess what happens? A new creation has come. God wants to do something new in and through you. A new, new creation has come. The old is gone now. The past, the rejection, the fear, the worry, the isolation, the walls, the barriers. Guess what? That mask that we wear when we come to church for fear of what will people think of us? And if I truly let people in, uh, they won't like me. If I truly let people in, uh, I don't know. I sit with people all the time, and they start talking to me about some things, and then they kind of take a time out, and they're like, hold up. Is it cool to talk about this stuff with you? I'm like, uh, you're the one that scheduled the appointment, right? I assume that we're going to talk about this. Yeah, but, you know, I'm going to, I don't know if I want to share everything. And I think that's part of our issue, right? We don't want to share everything for fear that somehow, like, you're, you're not, you're not going to accept me now. Guess what? We no longer live in that fear when we understand that God's already accepted us, that God's love extends beyond that. And when we accept his love, we are made new in him. The new has come. The old person is now here. And that is something to celebrate. That is something so incredible to celebrate that God has done that for us. But he doesn't just make us new. I love this part. He doesn't just make us a new creation, but when God does something new in and through our life, he provides us not just a brand new life, but a brand new family and a brand new community and a brand new perspective on life. When you come to know Jesus, you're welcomed into the family of God and you look around, you're like, ha, free friends. They're everywhere. But only if you're willing, only if you're willing to allow God to work in your life, Here, here's the catch. For you to become who he's created you to be so that you can be in quality relationships with others. See, our culture will try to tell us it's all about you. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. I'm trying to find the special someone. I'm trying to find that, that's, that, that people group. I'm trying to find that certain friend group. I'm trying to find this certain thing. You know, it's not, life doesn't begin with you finding something. Life begins when you start becoming when you start becoming who Jesus has created you to be, then that makes you different. That makes you a brand new creation. And let me help you with something. People take notice of that. People see a difference in that. I, I, I can't explain it, but just pe people know something's different about you when you say yes to Jesus first. A brand new life, a brand new family, a brand new community, a brand new perspective. And Jesus then takes it a step further and he issues us a brand new command when we live in our relationships. It says it this way. This is in 1 Corinthians. Uh, excuse me, uh, not in 1 Corinthians. John, John 13, 34. He says, a new command I give you. Now, listen, this is interesting, right? You're going to hear this, and you're like, no, it sounds familiar. Love one another. Yeah, yeah, everybody that's hearing Jesus right now as Jesus talks about this, they, they, know, they know this. Like, what do you mean? I'm giving you a new command. They must have stopped and scratched their heads. But think about what just happened. If you read in the context of Scripture, Jesus has just washed his disciples' feet. <laughs> He's spending his last few moments with them. He's hanging out with them, telling them, look, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to give my life for you. The disciples fully can't figure it out. And at this last meal together, Jesus, he stops and he begins to serve them. He begins to connect with them. He begins to wash their feet. And once he finishes washing their feet, he begins to say this, a new command I give you to love one another, to which they said, no, 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 that's not new. Like, remember, that's old school. Like, that's Old Testament, right? Like, that's like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Like, every good Jewish kid knew that when they were being raised. Jesus says, listen, a new command I give you, love one another. Okay, so are you talking about Jesus? Like, like, love one another as you love yourself? Like, remember, you, you said that already, Jesus. Like, love one another as you love your... No, no, no. Jesus says, I give this new command to you, love one another, dun, 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 as I have loved you. Wait, time out, Jesus. I'm all for loving you. <laughs> I'm all for having a good relationship with you. God, there's so much to love about you, but people, I don't know if you know this, people are crazy. Right? People are difficult. Like, do you know my family? It actually stinks that I, get, I didn't get to pick them. Right? Like, I wish I could have. You know, or, or, you know, we got all these excuses. Like, God, like, are you sure? Like, like, not, okay, love God, love others. And we say it hypothetically. Jesus drives it home and says, no, this is not if you get a chance to or when you get around to it. Or, or he says, no, if you're following me, 
If you're growing spiritually, if this is going to be your best year personally, as you grow spiritually this year, you have to understand what does it mean to love others. And you, you don't go to your world to find that. You don't go to culture to find that. You don't go to Tinder to find that, right? Like click, click. That's what our relationships have become, right? It's like click, 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 you know, a scroll, 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 you know, like swipe right, you know, but mostly left, you know, like what. He says, that, that, that's, that's not what I'm, he says, my command is that you love one another as I have loved you, that I, I gave, I'm giving my life to you, I, I'm, I'm serving you, I'm coming alongside you, I'm choosing to show up, I'm choosing to be present, I'm choosing to walk with you, that's how you must love one another, to which they're thinking like, where are you going with this, Jesus? And he says, it's by this that everyone is going to know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Jesus is commissioning them to, to be in relationships with others. He's saying that the church, that the community of faith, that the people who have placed their faith in Jesus, their relationships should look so radical and so countercultural to the world around us that people take notice and go, what's different about these guys? Like, what's the deal going on? Like, you know, they love each other in a way that like, man, it just goes beyond. Like they, they help each other. They serve each other. I mean, they sell stuff and give it to other people who have need. They bring people groceries. But you know, that, that was all modeled in that early church in Acts, right? Where... Everybody looked around and no one had need. Why? Because relationships were being lived out in the context of God's love. And as we love like God, as we love like Jesus, the world takes notice and things begin to change. Our relationships become different. Another way you can say that is that the better your relationship with Jesus gets, the better your relationships with others become. The better your relationship with Jesus gets, the better your relationships with others become. Husbands and wives, you want a better marriage? Then I'm encouraging you to get better at your relationship with Jesus. Hey, hey, couples that are dating in the room, you want to make sure you found the one? Check out their prayer life. Check out their spiritual life. You think that's old-fashioned? That's not old-fashioned. That's just common sense. That's just something to think through. Why? Because two of you can grow separate on your own. But guess what happens? When you switch that and you put Jesus in the middle and you choose to pursue Jesus, you can't help but to grow closer together. As you continue to pursue Jesus, he begins to change who you are. It's not just behavior modification. It's life transformation. And you become the kind of person that other people want to be with. You can be trusted. People can love you because they know that you are a loving person. Why? Because the better your relationship gets, the better your relationships with others become. And here's what I want to say about that. Even the most difficult relationships, you know which ones they are, with the people that are extremely difficult to love, the ones that don't want to love you back, the reality is, is that your relationship with Jesus grows, your relationships with them become better. This is important for us to understand that God can change everything. And so, so John says it this way. He gives a command to those that are following Jesus. He says, dear friends, then, then if we know this, right, if we understand this, that Jesus can change everything, let us love one another because we know that love comes from God and everyone who, who loves has been born of God and actually knows God. Why did I put that scripture up there? So you can have an assessment tool. Remember, we're self-assessing ourselves. Where are we at in our relationship with God? How are we doing and growing spiritually? He says that you, you don't just talk about love. You don't just talk about this idea of what it means to love God, that you actually begin to live it out. You begin to live out what it means to love God. Why? Because you actually have a relationship with God. When you have a, you don't just know of God. You don't know things about God. When you have a real relationship with God, then guess what? The love begins to flow from you. You learn to love God, and then you love others, and, and everything becomes new and different. Listen, I understand that in relationships sometimes, they're so complex, they're so all over the board, there's so much going on that we may not know the answer. We may not know what to do next. We might not know how to fix the dilemma that we're in, but there is one question that we can always ask in the midst of any relationship, and it's simply this. What does love require of me? If we were to love as Jesus loved, if he poured out his love for us, he gave his life for us, he's made us a new creation. We know what that kind of love is because now we have this relationship with God and we know God's love. If we extend that love, then no matter what relationship we're in, no matter what the dynamics are happening, we can pause and ask ourselves, wait, what does love require of me? When it comes to our relationships with our spouse, 
and they're pushing our buttons and they're irritating and uh, marriage is hard. Wait, time out. What does love require of me? When we're parents, you know, we've got kids and our kids are working on our last nerve. Amen, somebody, right? Because kids, woo, work. And as much as we want to be a dictator over their life and as much as we want to force them to do things so we can stop and ask ourselves, wait, 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 wait. What does love require of me? When I'm, when I'm in this dating relationship and maybe I'm feeling a little bit pressure to go somewhere where I know I shouldn't go, do something that I shouldn't do, right? But I'm feeling like, you know what, like I find my worth and value in this person for some reason and I don't want to lose that and I'm afraid if I make this choice that it's going to, you know, it's going to create tension. Stop, ask yourself, what does love require of me? Love might require of you to make a better decision. Love might require of you to wait. There's lots of things you could be waiting for in the relationship. You choose to wait and you receive the blessing of waiting. Finding God in that waiting. Right there. With you. Whatever that is, you, you can choose to, to pause and ask, what does love require me? But, but the most that I want to kind of focus in is just, how do you actually make room in your relationships? I'm going to give you four things in our last few minutes together that I think are important. And, and like we said, every single week, we're trying to focus on these notes. We're trying to give you something in your hand that you can take with you that you can immediately apply to your life. That you can just choose one. You don't have to do all four, but maybe some of you, maybe you need to do all four. But if you just chose one, I guarantee, I guarantee that you'd see a difference in your relationships. I guarantee that it would be an invitation for God to work and to move because you placed him first. What does it look like to make room in your relationships? First, I would suggest it's the willingness to invest in my most important relationships. What are your most important relationships in your life right now? Husbands, is that your wife? Wives, is that your husband? Should be. What is your most important relationship beyond just your husband, wife, friendships, your relationship with God? Your relationship with God coming first. We were first created to be in relationship with God, then in relationship. What if we begin to invest in those relationships? What do I mean by investing in those relationships? It's, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but actions and truth. Like, let's just not just like go, I love you, I love you, I love you. Oh, this is great. Let's not just, let's just not talk about like, uh, you know, how great would it be if? How about we just, we put some action to it and we begin to love and with actions and, and with truth. And you're like, well, how do you do that? Three Bs. Three Bs. I'm going to give you three quick Bs that I think are good. Like just implement the three Bs this week in your most important relationships. And I think you'll see a big difference. And the first is this. Hey, what if you took some time to just be known? We spend so much time walling people out, not sharing what we're feeling. I don't know if I can share my true feelings with you because I don't know how you're going to react. If I tell you that you stink, I mean, are you going to, you know? If I ask you to pick up the stuff around the house, are you going to, you know? The last time we talked about this, we got in a big old argument and a big old fight. And the next thing you know, I was like, I'm, I'm never going to say that again. Right? And so we, we stuff our feelings. We stuff what's going on. Parents, what about this? How many of you work so hard trying to appear perfect between your, to your kids? I, I know it's common. You want your kids to look up to you. You want your, your kids to think that you're a good parent. But how many of you know you got some flaws? That maybe, maybe if you just owned those flaws... Maybe if you just said, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm going to own that. I'm going to be known to you as, as my kid. Like, I, I mean, I, I can't cover that up. I'm not going to excuse it away. I, I mean, you saw with your own two eyes, like, I screwed that up. I'm not going to pretend like it wasn't my fault. What, what if you allowed yourself to become known and stop trying? Just put down the mask. What if you got into a community group and started building friendships within a community group, and just hanging out with people, and you go from just being a face in the crowd, and you become a name with people throughout the week, beyond the weekend, that know what's going on in your life and can pray with you and walk with you. What about this? What about being present? Being present. You're going to see this today. Many of you are going to leave this service and go to lunch. And then you're going to get to your table at lunch, and you guys are going to be having a conversation while your face is in front of your phone. Or maybe there won't be a conversation. There's be sitting at the table, this communal place, this place where community is supposed to happen, this place where phones initially weren't invited to be a part of, and now suddenly everybody has one in their hand and nobody's connected. What if you, what if you be present? What, try this today. Try this today. Would you just try some eye contact with somebody? You know what you're going to get after you give them eye contact? A whole lot of awkwardness. 
right? Because people don't know how to connect anymore, right? Just, just ask somebody how they're doing and just stare at them right in their eyes and watch them get all... They might even say stuff to you like, like, what, what, what? I'm like, nothing, I'm just, I'm just listening. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm not looking at you like anything. I'm just listening. Stop looking at me. It's making me uncomfortable. I'm like, I just called eye contact. Right? Just, just be present. And I know I've been talking about parents a lot, but I think maybe somebody needs this. Parents, your kids are dying for your attention. And you're so busy with everything you got going on that you feel like you can't give it to them. Just make a choice. Just put some things. Put the phone down. Put the computer away. You, you, you don't have to look up the next greatest thing. You don't have to be on Pinterest the whole time. Just, let, just give a few minutes. You, the people in your life, they deserve your time and your attention. They deserve your time and attention. And, and then you get involved. You get involved with their life. You choose to get involved with their life. You don't just call them up or you don't just text them and say, hey, thinking about you. Hey, thinking about you, right? You, you, maybe, maybe you take that to the next level and, and you text them and you say, hey, I'm not just thinking about you, but I wanna know how can I pray for you today? God put you on my heart. How can I pray for you today? Better yet, hey, if, if you wanna get real crazy for Jesus, right? Like you can, you can pick up your phone and not just text, you can call them and actually physically talk to them and say, hey, God put your name on my heart. I was just thinking about you today. I don't know what you're going through, but hey, I wanna say, how can I pray for you? And then if you want to get real radical in Jesus' name, guess what you do? You pray for them, right? Like right then and there. Or you show up to their house. You don't just say, okay, yeah, I'll pray for you. Oh, yeah, I got you. I'll pray for you. No, you actually physically, physically do it. You pray for them. Why? Because you're willing to get involved. You're willing to put skin in the game. You're, you're willing to walk alongside people. You're willing to be a friend. Because that's what relationships are all about. What about this? I'll initiate meaningful relationships. I think that's important. I'll initiate meaningful relationships. I'll give you an idea what that looks like. A meaningful relationship with God. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God. You feel distant and disconnected from God. God doesn't want to be distant and disconnected from you. He wants to be in relationship with you. But what he's already, he's already took the initiative, and now he's inviting you to step across the line and say, God, I, I'm asking you to be Lord of my life. For others of you, you're in the room and maybe you have a relationship with God, but you need a relationship with the church. You need a relationship in a community group. You need a relationship on one of our serve teams because you need to be a part of something greater than yourselves. You need to be able to do life beyond just the weekend. You need to get out of rows and get in circles and hang out together and do life with other people. But here's the thing. You got to initiate that sometimes. Some of you, you sit back and you just scroll on Instagram. And you're like, I didn't get invited. I didn't get invited. Nobody told me. I missed the memo. Let me ask you something. When's the last time you invited somebody to something, to somewhere? When's the last time you created a something and said, hey, I want you to come over because I just want to hang out and get to know you guys? It's initiating meaningful relationships. There's a passage of scripture that says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of your, not thinking of yourselves better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests. But here's what you do. You take interest in others too. You take interest in others, too. And then I'll mend broken relationships. I'll give you the last two here. I'll mend broken relationships. I'm going to ask our worship team to come on out. I'll mend broken relationships. What do you need to do to, to mend broken relationships? It's choosing to be a peacemaker. It's not choosing to perpetuate the issues, to continue to inflict drama, to continue to let conflict arise, but it's to continue to step up and say, hey, I'm going to speak truth and love. I'm going to show grace and mercy, and I'm also going to be willing to forgive. Some of you have a hard time with forgiveness, and I need you to understand, forgiveness isn't letting that person off the hook in your life. Forgiveness, your lack of forgiveness is causing you to be stuck in a self-imposed prison, not fully living life. If you're willing to forgive, if you're willing to extend grace, you're willing to extend mercy, that's loving like Jesus. That's choosing to love like Christ. And as you love like Christ, guess what? You experience freedom in your life. And the last one is just simply this. Maybe we need to release some harmful relationships. Maybe we just need to release some harmful relationships in our life. Maybe there's some relationships that we've been stuck holding on to. There's some relationships that, you know, we, we think they're, they're, they're going to work out. They're going to get better. But you know what? They keep dragging us down. They keep pulling us back. We've tried everything we can on our own. They're just not healthy for you. 
You've got people, you're, you're trying to live for Christ, but you have people around you that aren't doing so. And they're making that difficult for you. And you so bad want them to know Jesus. And I think that that's honorable. We should be reaching those who are far from Christ. That's what we're all about as a church. But we also have to assess, is that relationship detrimental to our life? And maybe we need to release those harmful relationships. Maybe it's a relationship that causes us to continue to teeter back and forth between temptation. Maybe we got to release that relationship, continue to pursue our relationship with God and allow God to make room for the greater things that he has in store for our life. Let's pray together.